Take a guess on what the most complex structure we have encountered as a species is. And now take a look in the mirror. That's the most complex structure. The human body, and more specifically the human brain, is the most intricate structure we have seen in the universe. And it's something that we still don't quite understand. But in the quest of trying to replicate it, it has given us innovations in artificial intelligence such as DALI of OpenAI. And what's even more interesting is that we haven't been able to develop anything on the level of complexity of our brains. But somehow our brains developed independently through natural processes. So what if we try to use these processes to produce powerful algorithms? Well unsurprisingly this is exactly what we're doing, using algorithms called genetic algorithms. Their history stretches as far back as 1950 where we see Alan Turing's proposal for a learning machine. This was hypothesized to simulate the principles of evolution to solve problems, and shortly after we developed computer simulations for evolution, with the work of Baricelli and Frazier. However, it was not until the work of John Holland where we see genetic algorithms as we know them. This began in the 1960s, being published in the book Adaptation in Natural and Artificial Systems. And his work began by focusing on how the quality of the next generation can be determined in cellular automaton. But it would take decades for the algorithm to gain traction in the 1980s and 90s, this coincided with the exponential increase in the power of computers. In a nutshell, genetic algorithms take the principles of genetic evolution and try to build optimization methods from this. In nature we see evolution before our own eyes, such as a slow steering of bacteria to become resistant to antibiotics, or in cancer where a simple mutation can lead to a cascade and eventually a devastating illness, even to the point where fruit bears no resemblance to the past. Evolution occurs over a significant period of time, and the fundamental basis is that the instructions that determine the characteristics of an organism, DNA, encounters errors we call mutations. Some of these mutations are bad, and they can lead to diseases such as cancer. Some have very little effect, and some are advantageous. Usually the bad mutations result in an organism being less likely to reproduce, and thereby less likely to pass on their mutated characteristics. But an advantageous mutation would improve the chances of reaching the point of reproduction and passing on the trait. The chance that an organism reaches the point of reproduction is what we call the fitness of an organism. The fitter an organism, the more likely it is to pass on its genetic instructions to the next generation. And if we repeat this process over many many generations we can see that the advantageous mutations will be more likely to be passed on and thus outcompete the poorer mutations. So the key features here are we have instructions that can be mutated affecting the fitness of an organism, and over time changing the probability that an instruction set is passed on. But it's not only the quality of the genes that determines their effect, sometimes it depends on the environment. Here another factor determines how strongly good features are chosen and bad features are rejected, and these are called selection pressures. Think about early human evolution and you would see a different set of traits selected, but as technology develops, we see the selection pressures we face change, such as innovations in medicine that made it so that human survival is at an all time high and sometimes relatively benign mutations can suddenly become a hindrance. An example would be the red and grey squirrel populations in the UK. Red squirrels are almost becoming extinct as they find it more difficult to blend into the environment. This means that they die at a higher rate before reproduction compared to grey squirrels. Here the colour of a squirrel is a trait and the ability to avoid predators is a selection pressure. We can make this stronger by introducing more predators such as foxes or make it weaker by reducing their numbers. So these are the principles that genetic algorithms try to replicate. In a genetic algorithm, we start with a series of instructions or features. This is the initial diversity of a population. Each of these instruction sets is given a fitness value to dictate how likely it is to reproduce to the next generation, and by taking into account the fitness value as well as some random selection, we can find out the individuals that are selected to reproduce. At the point of reproduction, there is a chance a mutation will occur, slightly changing the instruction set and potentially its fitness value. Over time, the algorithm will attempt to converge to the highest fitness value, this would be the optimal instruction set, and just like natural selection, we have taken an initial population and found the optimal set of instructions from this. So what are some real world examples of genetic algorithms? Well one example is the field of machine learning. Genetic algorithms can be used to optimize parameters of a machine learning model resulting in better performance for a given task. And they are also being used in the field of finance to optimize portfolios to determine the best combination of assets to maximize returns and minimize risk. And genetic algorithms have also been used to help the design of robots, using evolution of designs to find the optimal solution for a particular problem. So that's one way how biology is affecting the way we solve problems. If you're into out of the box scientific ideas, consider watching this video on how we can make a dragon with science. And consider subscribing and thanks for watching.